Hi, and welcome to No Budget. This month I am talking with Terry McMahon, director, writer extraordinaire, probably most well known for his two films, uh, Charlie Casanova and Patrick's Day. Would that be fair in saying? Only two films. Yeah. Only two films. All right. Well, and you're also a teacher and a writer. I think you wrote for, um, what's, the, what's the soap opera that everybody loves here? Fair City. Yeah, Fair City. You wrote for Fair City, right? Days of Our Lives. Days of Our Lives. Nice. Really? The Irish my version. Mother, my mother used to watch Days of Our Lives. Really? Yeah, yeah. That the makes the a lot US of sense. version. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, let's get into it. So first, tell us a little bit about like what got you into filmmaking and what motivated you to go into an industry where you really have no hope of ever making any money. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> uh, you're literally right, accurate in terms of that privileged sense of being able to enter a so-called industry that you've no right to enter. But I was homeless for a while and I wanted to somehow stop being a ghost in my own life. Mm -hmm. And even though I had no qualifications or no right on any level to believe I, I had the privileged sense of entering a world, I started to write a first script because I thought if I create something on paper, maybe it might lead to something that will take me out of being a ghost in my own life. Mm -hmm. And that became, many years later, my first screenplay. Okay. That would uh, be Charlie Casanova? No, it was a script called The Dance Hall Bitch. Okay. And that script, somebody handed that script to somebody, and one of those bizarre scenarios, Daryl Hannah got her hands on it, and she mm -hmm. flew me over to Los Angeles to write a screenplay for her. Nice. So you're living in a corporation bed sit, and at the same time you're flying first class to LA. Mm -hmm. And it's that constant counterbalance between the two of them that seems to have been ongoing since then. Yeah, interesting. So I'm uh, curious about that. So uh, when you kind of got into the field, you don't have a lot of formal education in filmmaking. Do you feel that has made you uh, different in regards to a filmmaker? A lot of, uh, you see nowadays, I know in the corporate world and a little bit in, in filmmaking, I know a couple people have their, you know, masters in whatever and they kind of carry it with pride and I don't know if it necessarily makes them a better filmmaker. Do you think people learn anything by going the formal education route or is it more of a... I'm not opposed to formal education or academia. Mm -hmm. um, long after the fact I got a master's degree in screenwriting from IADT and it's a, a first-class honors master's degree and it means utterly nothing. Yeah. when you sit in front of a blank page and you have to start all over again. But the benefit of academia is that it can take somebody from a position of knowing nothing to giving them the theoretical and occasionally pragmatic combination of forces that allows them to think maybe they have the capacity to do it. Mm -hmm. So that alone makes them worthwhile. Okay. Does it make you a filmmaker or a writer? Not at all. Mm -hmm. Can you teach talent? Not at all. But you can teach form and structure and you can give somebody the tools to be able to apply what was formerly an abstraction that is the first step toward making it real. Let's jump into your films. The first one is Charlie Casanova. What uh, kind of motivated you to write that one and tell us a little bit about that one? Uh, well, uh, Charlie Casanova was, I think it was written about nine years ago and it was written at a time when terms like controlling class were regarded as conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. And my rage at my own cowardice and my disgust at the kind of scum who are determining our future combined into this rage-fueled screenplay that I knew nobody would ever make. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I am a unashamed hack whore for hire, mm -hmm. but if I am ever going to direct a film, now is the time. So I put a Facebook post up, intend making no budget to feature Charlie Casanova, need cast, crew, equipment, and a lot of balls. This is sincere, so bullshit is fuck off in advance. And I posted it at two o'clock in the morning with a glass of whiskey and was instantly embarrassed by it. And when I went to delete it, someone popped up. And then over the next 24 hours, 72 people popped up and then 100 people popped up. And then suddenly, two weeks later, with borrowed cameras, we were on a first day of principal photography set with a whole bunch of crazies that I'd never met before. And we shot it in 11 days and it became one of those bizarre scenarios where you end up with a film that will probably end up in your drawer. Instead, it was picked up for world premiere at South by Southwest and then was picked up for distribution by Studio Canal. Mm. So it becomes that crazy story of 
the impossible becoming possible and then at its highest point getting shot. Mm -hmm. And the film was one of the most hated films ever made. People do seem to hate it for some reason, which is interesting. Do you think that potentially feeds the popularity of the film though? Because there's that whole, you know... So there's no such thing as bad publicity. There you go. But anyone who ever said that doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. Because mm -hmm. there is such thing as bad publicity. And my mother loved the film. Actually, you know, she fucking hated it too. It's one of those things where it's a divisive film and it was set out to be divisive and it was set out to be, the only way I can phrase it is you pull the pin from a grenade and you throw it into a group and see what happens. Mm -hmm. It was never intended to be placatory or to allow the audience to have its genitalia tickled on the way to understanding its form or structure. Mm -hmm. The bizarre thing is that those who hated, hated with such a level of rage that there was fist fights at film festivals, there was a, a level of almost comic book rage. The two guys in particular, for whatever reason, when it came out on DVD, used to go into Tower Records and HMV because it was in the top 10 sellers at the time, and they took it out of the shelf and hid it behind other obscure films in the back of the shelf. Mm -hmm. And they did it every day. And I asked the guy in HMV, what's happening? And he says, we have no idea. He thought it was hilarious and strange. So people seem to take it very personally, yeah. in a good, in, for me, in a very exciting way. If you make a divisive film and it's embraced, you failed. Okay. If you make a divisive film and it generates that level of ambivalence, extreme ambivalence, then it's the beginning of a necessary conversation. And bizarrely, it, the film had remarkable champions and won a whole bunch of awards and all that kind of nonsense. Yeah. But at the same time, now there's a revisionism that's occurring because what was deemed to be so naive in terms of conspiracy theory is now the front of the Irish Times in terms of the scum where we're defining the country and our mm -hmm. destiny. Do you take any of that to heart, like any negative feedback to heart? I know a lot of people, especially like as creatives, you know, to be creative, you, you need to be a little bit more in touch with your emotions. Does, does any of the any negative feedback kind of get to you? Or? Well, the, the trolling, I'd never really know, knew what trolling was. Yeah. And then when you're in the middle of that shit storm, mm -hmm. you start going, okay, these people are taking it personally, and you've got to take it on the chin. But then when you're on the national airwaves and you have people like Joe Duffy and um, people like Tom Dunn literally viciously attacking your character mm -hmm. and defining that central character, Charlie Casanova, as being who you are mm -hmm. and making statements that your children are hearing or they're talking about in the kids' schools, it becomes a little bit crazy. Mm -hmm. And I remember on the day of its release, it's cinema release. I remember walking through town and going, I need to get out of town. I'm actually frightened. And I'm sure a lot of it was paranoia and projection on my own part. But you realize there's this national conversation that's happening in the Irish Times, happening on the national airwaves, that's about the decimation of a small film. Mm -hmm. And these are shows like Joe Duffy's show that never ever discusses cinema, yeah. suddenly attributing a half an hour of his show to insisting that this film is not just putrid rubbish, but that you should not go and see it. And that's a, very, that's a fascinating thing to discover because a film about how the controlling class destroy the working class manifested in its very release. Yeah. Well, and that's interesting too because it is, uh, since I moved to Ireland, it is something that is, is on people's mind and that whole class separation that I think goes to the history of the country. Um, and so it is interesting how that's still a conversation even nowadays. Well, not even still. It's, it's, it's the only conversation. Mm -hmm. The reality of how the controlling class is destroying not just our culture, but defining our destiny in a deeply destructive way. For me, the only, the only Irish filmmaker who seems to be, beyond Jim Sheridan, who's a, a, a great, great genius of a filmmaker, but in the, in the next generation, the only filmmaker who seems to be trying to engage in the politics of our nation is Lenny Abrahamson. And obviously a magnificent and deserved success. But when you look at Lenny Abrahamson, Abrahamson had released uh, what Richard did at this essentially the same time as Charlie Casanova and both of them are born out of the same event that happened in the Annabelle nightclub where a young kid was destroyed by a bunch of upper-class kids okay. and that impetus that first seed to become two entirely different films it was interesting that a film like what Richard did is profoundly embraced mm -hmm. and a film that comes from the same source material Charlie Casanova was profoundly rejected and for me, it's very interesting to see, okay, what is, what is that thing that generates in us that level of acquiescence and acceptance or that level of rage where we're willing to destroy the very thing that is trying to hold up a mirror to our own collective cowardice and my own personal cowardice?
All right, let's get into Patrick's Day, uh, another upbeat, positive movie. It is another upbeat, positive movie. So both very positive movies. Um, so first, let's kind of get into that. So there does seem to be kind of a very seriousness to your writing uh, in the films that you make. Why is that? Well, the bizarre thing is for me, Charlie Casanova is an, an acerbic satire in the extreme. Mm -hmm. And I find aspects of Charlie Casanova stomach-churningly comical. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to make an audience laugh and then for the laugh to be cut off in their throat halfway before it leaves the mouth. Mm -hmm. For the realist, Jesus, am I laughing at this? That, I love that kind of laughter. In terms of Patrick's Day, Patrick's Day is a love story. Mm. And it's a love story about how courageous we can be despite the fact that there's an entire system out there that is repressing us. Mm -hmm. Now, does that lead to very painful scenes in the film. Yes, it does. But surely any love worth pursuing is going to create inevitable pain. Mm -hmm. But there is a, of sorts, that may or may not be a real happy ending to that film. Okay. And it's driven by emotion. It's the antithesis of Charlie Casanova, which is a liar constructing a fallacy to pretend he's human. This is a human being who has a fallacy constructed for him to destroy him of his innate capacity to love. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a a deeply positive human love story. So, okay, all right. Um, in that one, I, I kind of want to get into, sorry, how you work with actors and stuff, because both films, I think, have great performances. And um, Mo from Patrick's Day has a few scenes in there where he's uh, just brilliant performances. How do you work with your actors to kind of pull that out? I know a lot of kind of indie and small films, they, they don't, Directors often don't know how to work with an actor to get a performance out, and it's just kind of they expect you show up, okay, I want you to be happy here, or you know, I want you to act like so and so from such and such movie, and go. And I think I don't think that really works too well. And I'm curious what your process is when working with actors and how to get a performance out of them. Well, there's a couple of small things that, in in terms of our culture of of teaching, we spend vast amounts of money and time in teaching directors about structure and form and cameras and lighting and all the elements except acting, which defies comprehension because an audience responds to the psychological and emotional truth of a human being in front of the lens of a camera. And to underestimate or undervalue the actor's contribution is not just absurd, but damaging to your film. I'm lucky enough in that I adore actors. I think actors are the most remarkably courageous and generous society I've ever encountered. This notion that actors are prima donnas and behave like a bunch of nonces is completely untrue. Mm -hmm. There are tiny, tiny exceptions to that, and they're invariably talentless morons. But the ones who are courageous in that way that I describe, all they want to do is capture a moment of truth in front of the lens of a camera. That's all they want to do. And they put their soul on the line for that. Mm -hmm. And your responsibility as a director is to protect that soul and to make sure that you create an environment, only an environment, where they are allowed to to jump off that cliff and succeed or possibly fail and know that either way you're going to catch them mm -hmm. and either way that you're going to hone their desire for truth. And to do that, you need to allow an actor to understand that not only do you love them, but you're going to protect them to the death. And you put them in that environment where you give them a very simple objective. An objective is something that they want and they may not even necessarily know yet, but it's something they're willing to live or die by. Mm -hmm. And once you give an actor a want, and once you put them into a position where there are obstacles stopping them getting what they want, then you just stand back and watch how they're going to address those obstacles. And all you're looking for is a moment of discoverable mm -hmm. truth on camera that is as fresh and raw for them as it is for an audience. And then you give it to an editor, and the editor, because they're brilliant, will see that moment and put it into a film. Mm -hmm. And that's the moment an audience is going to respond to long after the film is over. Do you know what that moment is going into the scene? Well, there's two schools of thought. One of them is that you storyboard everything and you make sure that the film that you had in your head six months ago while you were masturbating alone in your little dark room is somehow the film that you need to have replicated on the set. Mm -hmm. I think that's obscene and ridiculously one-dimensionally self-indulgent. I find it far more exciting to understand that everything is in motion, structure and form is in motion. Now you're in a, the realm of reality. Mm -hmm. And what can the actors bring to that? What can the cinematographer bring to that? What can everybody in the room bring to that that elevates it beyond the limitations of what your imagination was in the first place? Mm. Because the structure and form is already strong enough to withhold it. 
why not have the courage to see what they're going to bring to it? What about like, um, for you, it sounds like that works, but I think there are other directors that do more or less bring what they've envisioned, they film it on the day, and then go and they can make brilliant films. Um, like Hitchcock, for example, he's really well known for that. Hitchcock? Uh, yeah. What's your favorite Hitchcock film? Uh, let's say Birds, for example. Okay, who's in Birds? Uh, the blonde chick. What's her name? Tippi Hedren. Tippi Hedren. There Tippi you Hedren. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about Birds? Um, I remember scenes. What do you remember? What scene do you remember? Well, like the scene in the um, the room that she goes into. There's the birds in the room, and I know in that scene it's well known because she was not told about the birds being in the room. So what do you remember? But just in general, I'm just saying, like. So what do you remember about her walking into the room? The the fear of it. Her reaction. Right. Mm -hmm. No matter what Hitchcock may or may not have done, and Hitchcock is a giant, a master. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I'm saying. But no matter what he did or did not do, we are responding to the psychological and emotional impetus of that human being. Mm -hmm. You show an empty room that is suddenly populated by birds with no human reaction, we don't give a fuck. It's an avery. Mm -hmm. You show that psychological and emotional reaction, we are suddenly immersed. Mm -hmm. And Hitchcock himself, despite this notion that actors are props and you need to make sure they don't bump into the furniture, which yeah. was a total fallacy, okay. his relationship with actors was one of total empowerment. Mm -hmm. And some of the greatest performances of many of these actors' careers are in Hitchcock movies mm -hmm. because he created an environment where they were allowed to stretch and push and find that place of discoverable, discoverable moments in front of the lens. Okay. I don't think you have to be despotic or didactic in the sense where you go, this is how it has to be because it's my vision. I think not only is that damaging and masturbatory, but in fact an audience sniffs it a mile away. Yeah. And there are a small group of audiences who go, oh, isn't it wonderful that this director has his or her vision and they, they stick to that vision and nothing else. That's not a human engagement. Yeah. Do you feel, are you the same way when it comes to script dialogue and stuff like that? I'm assuming, based on what you've been saying, as long as they get the point across in, that it doesn't necessarily have to be word for word. No, it, well, I'm, I'm fascistic in terms of text. Okay. because it's written that way for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe the next film I make, I might be a little bit looser on it, but in the two films, mm -hmm. I wrote every line of dialogue. Interesting. Not because I want to protect that dialogue, but because that dialogue has function and form. Mm -hmm. People speak for two reasons, to either lie or to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And both those reasons are for the same pursuit, which is to get what they want. So if I'm lying to you or if I'm telling the truth, it's both to try and change you to get you to be what I need you to be. That dialogue to me is very important. But in terms of performance, you can't alter a performance. We can have the same line of dialogue. I can say to you, I love you, in a, a myriad of different ways to try and evoke a myriad of different responses in you. Based on what I'm trying to get from you, that's what an audience becomes immersed in. Mm. And it's the same thing. It's not just with actors. It's not just with text. It's not just with structure and form. It's with cinematography. It's with sound. It's with anything. It's with set direction, mm. art direction. It's where you go, okay, what can we do to this to elevate the audience experience to such a degree where they are subconsciously absorbing the kind of stimuli we need them to feel in order for them to reach forward and want to know more. Hmm. Interesting. In the writing process then, when you sit down and write, do you, first of all, do you enjoy the writing process? I and, fucking hate it. Okay. So how do you motivate yourself to write then if you hate writing? Usually because I have to get a check. Okay. Is that, yeah? Yeah. Why don't you direct stuff that other people wrote then? I would. Yeah? I would, there's four projects have fallen asunder in the last year. That I was attached to as director. Okay. And if, if they fell apart because of me as a director, I'd happily accept responsibility for it. But unfortunately, it was nothing to do with me. Okay. The people involved, the financials, all that realities either sometimes fall asunder or sometimes become problematic. I'd happily direct other people's material. Okay. But again, that simple thing. When I say I hate writing, I'm being slightly facetious. There is nothing more remarkable than a moment that happens on the page that you go, Christ, mm -hmm. that's as exciting for me as that discoverable moment for an actor or for an audience. Yeah. But in terms of writing, writing is tough, difficult, hard, lonely. And because we exist in a culture where script editors are elevated to the realm of being artists, we very often have a bunch of moronic failed writers who are called script editors who are producing the kind of rot that is derivative, imitative, and banal beyond belief. And they become the decision makers. So the kind of stuff and material that I want to write may not be for everybody. But fuck it, I want to do it. Okay, yeah. Well, some, obviously that works. I mean, you've had two films made. How did you find producers and uh, Charlie Casanova, you mentioned, you showed it at South by Southwest and it got picked up by um, a distributor. Was it similar with Patrick's Day? 
or did you already have um, production company and distribution lined up? No, I'm Charlie Casanova. Uh, there was a producer involved, but he kind of lost his way, and then I ended up having to take over production. Uh, on Patrick's Day, we had a great old school producer, Tim Palmer. Okay. He produced a bunch of wonderful Irish films, and we had co producer Rachel Lysett, a wonderful woman. So, the combination of the two of them, they, they made all the things happen that would have been usually impossible in my life. They did it for a certain budget, and they did it in a way that protected the heart of the film. We shot it in a short time frame, a relatively short time frame, but outside that, there were almost no limitations. They were very excited by the work that we were doing on set. We had John Burns, our first AD, and he was kind of shocked because he had to change how he would normally approach it as a first AD because sometimes they were taking longer than we were supposed to, but what we were capturing was so exciting that he decided to protect that and see how it would unfold. As a result, we had an extraordinary sense on set of maybe something special happening, particularly with Mo Dumford, Catherine Walker, Kerry Fox, and Philip Jackson, those four central performances, and then Aaron Monaghan where you're watching these actors do stuff that the greatest compliment a crew can pay a film is on the second or third day, instead of eating the burger, they stop halfway and they're watching what's happening. And then they turn to each other and they go, Jesus, this might be interesting. Nice. And we were lucky we had that experience. Let's talk financing, because I know that's a big one for indie films and small budget films. Like, how do you find financing for your films? The first film, Charlie Casanova, cost less than a thousand euros. Mm. And that was because of that post put on Facebook, but also because it was coming up to Christmas and I knew that Ireland kind of shuts down in January. And I had hoped that perhaps we might capture people at their downtime who would be excited enough by a screenplay that they might contribute. And it became one of these remarkable scenarios where so many people, and many of them very, very experienced people, decided that based on the screenplay they wanted to be involved. The money was spent mostly on food. And the reality of how that film was made is probably impossible to replicate because now we got this understandable notion of people not working for free and so on and so forth. But you also have to have time to be able to take off in your life. And I was writing a soap opera at the time, so I was able to briefly use that time. But what was interesting about The Priest and its set is that that was a film that was made for less than a thousand euros that was picked up by Studio Canal and distributed in cinemas in the UK and Ireland. The fact that a film can be made for that price on that equipment and still transfer onto a large screen in cinemas, yeah. that's a massively exciting precedent because you go, there's nothing stopping you. Your, your phone, literally your phone, has a greater capacity for f sound and vision than equipment that would have cost nearly a quarter of a million only 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. If you look at television from the 80s, you look at the, the quality of it, it's incredibly oh, yeah. bland. And you look at what these phones can do, what sound can do. And what's interesting, we were discussing it earlier, but the idea of the technological advancements are unprecedented. Imagine what John Cassavetes would have done with your phone. Imagine what Mozart would have done. But imagine what Van Gogh would have done with your phone. We have all those capacities available to us. But bizarrely and perversely, we don't seem to have the courage to tell the kind of stories that are deeply personal and might be personal to somebody in a dark room. So finances are not something that should be stopping you at all. No matter what the ambition is, there's still few things more compelling than having somebody in a private room do something that makes us go, Christ, I'm uncomfortable. And the person beside me is slightly uncomfortable. And the reason we're uncomfortable is because that person is doing something that we thought we were the only ones in the world who did. And now not only is our loneliness less restrictive, but our re recognition that we are not alone in the world becomes the conversation. Do you think such access to equipment potentially creates problems in regards to that there's so much out there. Um, for example, like I know in Ireland, there's like 30 something film festivals in the US who knows how many million are. And so there's just so many people making so many uh, small films competing for that hopeful distribution deal that they might get from a bigger studio. I think it depends on your objective for making those films in the first place. If you're making a film just to make a film, mm -hmm. forget about it. There's no point because it's already difficult enough. 
and it's already competitive enough. But if you're making a film because you are driven by a desire to make that person who is sitting in that dark room feel less alone by revealing your vulnerability to them, then not only is that journey going to be heartbreakingly difficult, but the end result is going to have a profound resonance with that person who you may never even meet. If you're not driven by that, do something else. Yeah, absolutely. You teach acting, uh, so what, uh, can you want to tell us a little bit about your uh, acting classes? I've been teaching for over 20 years, but it's, I teach a very specific form of what's called the Aristotelian construct, and it's everything that Western drama is constructed around. And it's based on the idea of not just empowering the actor, but teaching them the tools of form and structure, the things that we don't talk about in this country. Teaching the actor how to take the responsibility they have to a degree where they stimulate and provoke the audience into having a reaction. So you can't teach talent, but you can absolutely teach form and structure. And because we've been doing that for 20 years, and because of the reactions of the actors who've gone through it, you realize that given the proper tools, somebody with talent can connect with an audience on a level that is profound. And that's back to Emma Scanlon and back to Mo Dunford and back to the kind of actors I work with, where you go, how do you take an unknown entity and by the end of a 90 minute process, make an audience go, Christ, who the hell is that? Mm. And uh, last question, kind of, what, are you, what are you working on now that people should be looking out for? Not having a nervous breakdown. Okay, that's always important. And uh, if anybody wants to find out about any of your uh, classes or potentially if they want to see uh, Charlie Casanova or St. Patrick's Day, are they available? They're, both of them are on Amazon and all those kind of things. But if you just type my name into Google, I'm sure you'll somehow be able to access any information you want. Perfect. All right. Great. Well, thanks for uh, talking to us. And uh, have fun in Paris. Uh, which Is that where you said you were going? Or, yeah, yeah, Paris. So enjoy your uh, visit to Paris. Thanks, man. Thank you.